we are live sir uh friends uh, members of indian arthroscopy society uh, let me first thank you for joining in on a sunday evening today uh, it's a very interesting webinar and we talk about mini open lethargy uh, this is a surgery which is very relevant to our practice and we have a master dr alberto constantini joining in from rome italy uh, professor is uh, 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 from hospital of concordia uh, special surgery in italy and he is also a committee member for isacos for hip groin and thigh committee i must thank uh, dr karthik raj for arranging this webinar for all of us karthik if you can uh, kindly introduce our guest faculty today so we know a lot about him then and then we uh, go to his presentation thank you ips sir uh, uh, i did not give any introduction about dr alberto he is already known across the globe for his excellent work on arthroscopic surgeries mainly involving the shoulder knee and hip dr alberto had finished uh, his training in orthopedics from italy rome university and he is right now involved in the concordia hospital in italy he is also associated actively as a faculty and a member with number of uh, prestigious communities across the globe starting with sicot isacos and number of other arthroscopy hip knee and shoulder committees and what not he has published numerous journals in the field of arthroscopy also he has penned down number of chapters in various books he has been instructors in different programs including caravic and trained a lot of people and lot of fellows and i think a lot of fellows will be uh, involved in this uh, listening to him and eager to ask questions to him so i welcome and thank dr alberto constantini for accepting this webinar thank you sir i give it thank over you. to you uh please share your presentation again so uh did you see my screen no it's not visible sir you need to share again okay yes. did you see that yes yes it's working Okay, perfect. So, uh, first of all, thanks to all my Indian friends now, because I spent some time with you and uh, learned a lot from you. So, once again, thanks for this uh, this invitation. Uh, my uh, my talk will be on uh, on lethargy, uh, tips and tricks on lethargy. But I would spend some time uh, before of talking this, uh, explain some principle of uh, uh, shoulder stability because for me this is important to understand why then we approach to uh, to lethargy. So uh, just to know. how uh, uh, shoulder instability is spread all over the world and uh, uh, as you see in this paper uh, we have 20 cases for uh, 1000 of people but uh, what what is important to understand uh, is the different kind of uh, number of dislocation that we can have according to the uh, this paper from uh, from US the, where they are very Uh, precise in in the number uh, how many is different uh, the uh, the um, uh, the instability in normal people in general population against uh, athletes or military person so who are most involved in shoulder activity has the higher probability to dislocate the shoulder and uh, why this is a, this is a, um, uh, my patient Uh, uh, who presented me with uh, in, with this situation? See how is difficult to, to understand the process that bring us to uh, to decide what kind of uh, procedure to do in case of instability. And uh, one other thing: so when we have uh, this location, we have in 71 percent glenoid bone loss. So it's very frequent as some bone loss during instability. 41% in the first case is in the in the first time 86% in the recurrence uh, um, uh, episode and uh, with recurrent shoulder dislocation only 10% as intact bone so you see how is frequent have 
bone uh, lesion. Even in, uh, with this paper, we see uh, 158 shoulders with anterior inferior dislocation, 73% as bony defect in the glenoid. And why is important the glenoid? Because uh, where we have the contact area and we have bone loss, the contact area decreases, but the contact pressure increases. That is, means that the head that goes in that quadrant, in the anterior inferior quadrant, have more uh, facility to dislocate. But we, don't, we have not to consider only one side of the joint, but we have to consider only, only uh, uh, both sides. So uh, after the glenoid, also the humerus is important. And you see the, uh, how the, the, the percentage of dislocation increase. We have a 75, 77, 77% after the first dislocation but up to 93% in recurrent case. So also the uh, humerus is important. And also it's important how we check the, um, uh, the ILSATS. Only 7% is uh, revealed by the X-rays, 93% is revealed by the MRI, and 47% from the arthroscopic examination. The problem is, uh, which is the cause that can uh, um, cause instability? Maybe the dip of the uh, of the hill sacs, or how much glenora, um, humeral head is involved in uh, uh, in lesion, or the diameters of the hill sacs, or the volume of the hill sacs. But one thing is important: the position of the hill sacs. That's mean. Uh, uh, remind me, uh, I, when I start with arthroscopy, uh, Steve Burkhardt was one of my uh, instructors and I spent time with him and he talked about uh, engaging or non-engaging non sacs. So if no engaging sacs, arthroscopic procedure will be good, like in this case. But when we have no bone support, that means that we have an engaging in sacs, like in this case, we have to proceed with bony, with bony um, uh, surgery. But the problem is, if we don't fix the anterior inferior glenohumeral ligament, what means? This means that uh, we try engaging or non engaging, we are doing not the truth, because we, we don't have any more. Uh, anterior stability of the shoulder, and so we may have engaging or non-engaging. So we miss something. The other things that I say you before uh, regard the engaging or non-engaging in sacs is the orientation of the sacs. When we have engaging in sacs, we have that the sacs is more oriental horizontal. When we have non-engaging heel sacs, the heel sacs is more vertical. And this is important in abduction and external rotation, change the orientation of the heel sacs, and it, can, it can't engage against uh, the humerus. So my question is, I can try once I repair art with, uh, the uh, with uh, uh, in arthroscopic way with a bank arthroscopic bank art, I can try to, to do the maneuvers in abduction and external rotation, if see if that heel sacs go to engage or not engage the anterior rim. So I, we, we need uh, uh, another things that uh, leads us what kind of uh, um, shoulder is preferred. This is uh, uh, another my patient. He's a 16 year old, he's a rugby player, two dislocation, and he go with a banker repair new dislocation after 18 months. So in this case, we have, we have done at the beginning the right choice or we missed something. Uh, for me, this is a crucial point. The instability uh, severity in the score of, from Pasquale Balot uh, lead us the, the mind of uh, when we see the patient and we have uh, 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 X rays, age, we can try to put together all this information to understand before surgery, which is the best way of treatment that we can do. 
if we look at this uh, IC score, we can check different important points, the age of surgery, the degree of sport that uh, uh, these, these athletes does, uh, if, they, uh, if he has a shoulder hyperlaxity, what kind of uh, X-rays, I mean, if we can check his sacs or we can check some def defect in the uh, contour of the glenoid. And what we uh, saw is that uh, uh, if the easy score is under three point, we have less chance of recurrence, about 5%. But if the IC score is higher, more than six, we have 70% of recurrence. So that what means this? Uh, this is important when uh, Pascual Balot re recently in uh, 19, uh, uh, 2019, uh, he, he, he published this editorial comment in which uh, uh, he answered to, to the question, which parts with patients are likely to undergo redislocation after an arthroscopic banker repair? And the, uh, the answer was that we know part of the answer, but the easy score is over three points, the game is over. That means that the patient has high uh, possibility of recurrence if we do with arthroscopic. Uh, this is a paper from uh, an Italian group, and uh, we see how uh, is the percentage of success of uh, uh, arthroscopic bankart if we have uh, three, three group of patients divided according to the, to the number of the IC score. So the best way is the with the people that has 103 points in, uh, in the IC score. So 93% of success, there is a, an acceptable um, uh, way. My partners makes a little advancement in, uh, uh, in this score. Once because uh, uh, IC score is a very good tool. It's a, as I told you, is open our mind on before surgery, what kind of surgery we can choose. But if we look at only the number, we can choose more uh, open surgery respect to arthroscopic surgery. So the, the, the best things that Giovanni does in, uh, in this paper was to add uh, the, uh, in, in the IC score partner, uh, also uh, the principle of uh, uh, glenoid track that is very important for, uh, for our school. So this is important because the result of this, uh, um, of this paper are that, that when we use only IC score and uh, obviously plain uh, radiography parameters, we have twofold more in recommending G against uh, um, uh, arthroscopic procedure. So uh, we can delineate more much more better the patient to uh, divide it into arthroscopic or open group if we use this kind of, uh, uh, of tool. This is a very good paper and uh, uh, I recommend you if you want to, um, to study. So I introduced the concept of the glenoid track and this is, as I told you, this is very important for our school. And the glenoid track is, uh, is uh, 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 is the place in which the humeral head take contact with the glenoid. And this is 83% of the glenoid width. So if we have GW is the glenoid width, GT, the 83% of this is GT and is the, uh, represent the glenoid track. So we can divide it according to this, the people in on-track lesion and off-track lesion of the heel sacs. What means? If we have this location, you see that we have an heel sacs. And if we refer this heel sacs to the glenoid track and we translate it to the, um, uh, to the uh, CT scan, we can check how heel sacs is still contained into the glenoid track. Glenoid track goes from medial part of the calf to, uh, to the medial head. So we are on track because we have bone support. So 
if we have lesion that we define on track, we can do uh, arthroscopic procedure because we have bond, so bond support that can stabilize our, uh, our shoulder. So we repair and the shoulder comes stable again. But instead, if we have uh, uh, an off-track lesion, that it means that uh, the um, heel sacs is not lateral, but is more medial. And this involves the bony support. Now we are defining this, this uh, um, uh, lesion off track. And also we see that we report on the same uh, TC scan uh, where we measure the, um, the glenoid track. Now the sax is outside the glenoid track. So this shoulder would be unstable even uh, when, when we repair with, uh, uh, with our arthroscopic way. So uh, for the off-track lesion, we recommend to do a bony uh, support procedure. But the problem is when we have the so-called bipolar bone lesion. That means that we have lesion from uh, humeral head and glenoid side. So as you see at the beginning, we have a lesion that we define on track, but contemporary, we have a lesion on the, on the glenoid. And this is a problem because it lacks of bony support from the glenoid and the shoulder is going to dislocate it again. So we can measure, we have remembered that in the, in the classic glenoid track, we have to reduce the, the part of the bone that is missing due to a glenoid bone loss. So this is important to, to understand the both side uh, of the lesion. So we have glenoid defect and we have humeral is, uh, defect. Now the problem is uh, uh, the problem how to, to measure the, uh, the bone loss and uh, uh, maybe because with the presence of the concomitant it sucks, uh, we should be more aggressive and using a bone block procedure. One of the problem is uh, how much is the glenoid bone loss? Because, because in literature we see a lot of number and uh, uh, classically, we define 20, 25% of bone loss as the uh, critical point, the threshold in which we have to do um, bony procedure. But the problem is not like this, because this could be um, value, valuable for a general population. But we have to consider also the athletes and the high demand people, heavy worker, etc., etc. So it starts to publish in literature uh, paper in which we, see, we saw that uh, the, the glenoid bone loss is not 25 or 20, but much less. In this paper, for example, uh, we, uh, they consider 50% of the large anteroposterior width of the glenoid as uh, um, dangerous for uh, arthroscopic procedure. In this other paper from uh, uh, Korea, uh, anterior, anterior, anterior glenoid bone loss of 73% is, is a critical point. And this is important paper from Tokish in which establish the, uh, the threshold of glenoid bone loss at 30.5%. And this is important, not only uh, he discuss about redislocation, but this is important for the quality because he works the, the was his score and, uh, and this is an acceptable uh, outcome independence uh, of the presence of recurrence. So uh, we have to consider, especially in, uh, in heavy worker athletes, uh, that the, mm, the critical point is not 25%, 20%, but it's much less, about 30%, like Turkish uh, uh, published in the, lit in the literature. And uh, uh, also these other um, 
paper from, uh, from New York. Uh, this is an additional support of the concept of subcritical sub bone loss at 30.5%. And uh, the question is at this point, why uh, we choose letter G? Uh, this is the patient that I showed you before. And if you remember the IC score, we have three points that are critical for deciding if arthroscopic or not. 16 years old, the, 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 the player is a rugby player, so it is a contact player, and the present at the AP of the ill sacs. These, these are value are seven, and according to the easy score, should not be done arthroscopically, but in open way. So what I've done after the, I, wa I was uh, operated uh, the second way, I, I removed the, uh, the mobilized uh, um, uh, anchor that you see down there in the, in the, in the axilla. I removed the, uh, the anchor and I do uh, a lateral J procedure. So uh, this is important because uh, if we live alone, we may have more and more bony defect that is became harder and harder to, um, to treat. Also, there are people that talk about borderline glenoid bone defect in which they put in relation arthroscopic bankart against uh, uh, lateral procedure. And uh, the results are that the lateral procedure is a valid option in recurrent instability. Also, this paper um, uh, talks about uh, uh, Latergé uh, appear to be a better choice in, pa in patient with uh, revision instability, collision and contact, uh, contact athletes. And they, send this, they, they write that uh, uh, people with 10% of glenoid bone loss. And when we say 10% of glenoid bone loss, we are talking about very few millimeters of glenoid bone loss. So this is a, an important uh, point to, to keep in mind. And also uh, this, uh, um, this paper from Christian, Christian Gerber, this is very another um, beautiful paper in which the, uh, they say, as you see, that uh, the return to sport is good for both, but for people that are um, submitted to arthroscopic uh, bankart, in the five years uh, of follow-up, the, uh, the level of satisfaction decreases, and they are prone to, to be from one to five more uh, redislocation, especially in the first five years. And they concluded that they don't, do not recommend an arthroscopic banker procedure to patients that have recurrence anterior dislocation. So Bankart, uh, here it is uh, uh, Mr. Bankart, is uh, one of the, our choice uh, in the presence of bony defect. Um, and we use the three uh, effect that we may have with uh, this uh, uh, kind of procedure. The capsule effect, the bone block effect, and the sling effect. But are we sure that we are doing this, uh, uh, are saying the, the, the same things? Because look at this paper published uh, uh, 2009 from Jill Walsh, uh, uh, Toy or Caulfield, this is very important because uh, they, they stated that the true mechanism is still unknown and there is no biomechanical study in the literature. But we saw with the here that we have uh, many uh, paper. One of these say that uh, uh, the latter J is, uh, uh, is a very good uh, procedure and decrease the anterior inferior translation and maintain the ROM. This is important in the athletes because they don't lose external abduction, external rotation, especially during the, the movement of uh, throwing. But one, one, one thing that they leave, uh, one phrase that they leave at the end of the, uh, of the paper that uh, say that it did, it did not support the belief that utter inferior stability is provided that by the sling effect. This is one our thinking that the sling effect is the, for us is the key point of the lateral procedure, not according to this paper, but 
we will see uh, during the, the next year, which is the best way of stabilize the shoulder. So start with, uh, with the uh, core of, of, of the talk, which is the tips and tricks of the Latergé. Uh, this is a shoulder that we saw before uh, a live surgery. And if you see, there is a fracture into the coracoid. So please, when you decided to do a surgery, look carefully at the, um, the X-rays because it gives you a lot of important information. In this case, we are lucky enough because the, um, the size of the coracoid is bigger and uh, we are able to, to do, to proceed with normal latergé and also we have the already done. This is our position. Uh, we have position in beach chair. We have uh, um, we are getting better with the position, but uh, we have another uh, seat uh, system, and uh, uh, we start with the incision that is classic deltopectoral incision, um, four five centimeter, and we look for the interval for the vein. There is no uh, much different uh, difficult in doing this. Uh, when we arrive at the coracoid plane, we have to decide what to do because we can uh, uh, check the coracocremal ligament and decide if we want to do like Jill Walsh, that means leave some uh, millimeter, uh, one centimeter of uh, coracocremal ligaments to uh, reattach the capsula at the end of the procedure or do like Burka and Nebir and clean uh, completely the, um, the bone. So what we should be avoided? Well, first, take the, the graft small, because if you take the graft small, uh, we can just uh, don't do uh, completely uh, the, the classic lat um, lateral procedure. And uh, the coracoid dimension should be at, at be uh, 2.5 centimeter, that is enough to uh, to put uh, to, uh, to screw, and uh, uh, as I told you, the coracoacromia ligaments. Uh, we don't close routinely the capsula like Jill Walsh. We do, um, uh, we do the closure of the capsula, uh, especially when we have women uh, with some grade of uh, hyperlaxity. We prefer close doing like a capsular shift. But uh, uh, according to the, this paper and according to our experience, and we published that, there is no, uh, if we had a capsular closure, there is no uh, difference in, uh, uh, in the result uh, regarding stability and uh, success of the procedure. So uh, this is the, what we do. Uh, we look at the coracoid, we uh, sign the dimension and uh, uh, we start to release the uh, coracocromial ligaments and, uh, and from one side and the pect minor from, uh, from the other side. Uh, we use uh, the uh, 90 degrees uh, um, sagittal uh, uh, saw, and uh, we start from uh, lateral and we go into medial, and we go from uh, posterior to anterior, and uh, try to avoid to, to do, um, uh, to remove the, the, the so-called knees of the, uh, of the curacoid. One of the uh, weakest point of this is uh, the, um, the muscular nerve, the musculocutaneous nerve, because uh, it uh, lies uh, um, uh, four millimeter distal to the uh, tip of the coracoid. But uh, if we don't do uh, traction, we don't have a, a problem with the nerve. So uh, when we manage the, uh, the coracoid, uh, please don't, uh, um, uh, don't make uh, uh, traction uh, to avoid injury to this nerve. Uh, we clean the coracoid and uh, we, we looking for a better uh, bone bled because this is the uh, surface of our um, integration with the neck of the glenoid. 
and uh, we do uh, we see, you see that we protect the posterior part uh, with a uh, forked omen and we have this device that can, uh, allows us to have uh, the key wire parallel uh, and then as you know we use the plate uh, in, in, in the surgery so we have um, the equal distance for the hole and once we have created the pilot hole we pass to the other step we can do also uh, with this device uh, the hole and uh, uh, in this case one uh, one important thing is that we see the distance and we saw exactly how is distance between the hole and the margin of the coracoid to avoid overhanging of the um, of the graft. At this point, there is another uh, crucial point of the laterge, and uh, what kind of uh, what what we have to do with the subscapularis. Um, in literature, there are many uh, many three types of uh, um, uh, tenotomy. One, this is the entire tenotomy of the uh, subscapularis, but we don't do uh, absolutely one because we, clo we, we reduce the, um, uh, the possibility of the rotation and the second because we increase the, um, uh, the uh, fat uh, degeneration of, of the subscapularis. Uh, this is another um, uh, tenotomy, L tenotomy, uh, that we don't do, but it's described in literature. It is a little bit better of the complete the tenotomy. Uh, this is uh, um, uh, the osteotomy of the small tuberosity, but even this is uh, too aggressive for this kind of surgery. And uh, we do um, the split of the subscapularis. Uh, a split in, uh, uh, in, the, in the inferior third of the subscapularis, just above the, uh, the three sister. And I show you uh, what we do. What we do. Uh, this is the subscapularis. We've put the, uh, hell, um, the arm in external rotation. So we have part of the tendon and part of the muscle. And we choose the inferior third that you see down here, the, the three sisters. So we are a little bit higher of the three sister. And then with the Gelpi retractor, once we have done the little split with the scissor or the, um, or the forceps, we have the capsula just beneath our, uh, our Gelpi. Uh, obviously that uh, the subscapularis in this way is uh, pretty protected, so we don't have uh, uh, much uh, much problem. And uh, uh, according to the literature, the great problem are with the completely uh, tenotomy or with the L shape of the position. If we use uh, subscapular split, we don't have any problem with uh, the position of the bone block, and there is no special morbidity of, uh, of the patient. So um, my recommendation is uh, in uh, uh, above the inferior third of the subscapularis, uh, keep attention, not going too much medial because you have uh, uh, the long end of bison, the, the bicipital groove on the long end of biceps. So uh, stay a little bit away. And uh, we start the, uh, the capsulotomy with the internal rotation and then little by little, we do an external rotation and we put under tension the capsula. So we have the two limbs of the capsula and then uh, we go down there with the Fukuda retractor and uh, uh, three fork uh, Oman in the, in the medial side. And uh, this is the only, no, we, we, may, we miss one and I'll show you later. Uh, this is the, the only retractor that uh, we need to do uh, an uh, um, um, uh, laterge procedure. Uh, we remove everything and we just had another, another uh, retractor 
as you see here, that helps us to uh, rise the capsula and the subscapularis to have a better view of the um, uh, of the glenoid neck. So what we call this, this is a procedure of tree destructor. And at this point, we need to understand where put the graft. Uh, we have the standard Laterge path uh, procedure of the congruent arc uh, according to uh, Burkhardt. Uh, we do uh, standard Laterge path procedure. And uh, first of all, like we have done into the, um, um, the coracoid, we refresh the bone <coughs> of the glenoid neck and we go to fix the, uh, to create the hole for the screw insertion. And we can do in two way or free with your free hands. And you look the inferior part of where you want to put the, the, the screws. And then with the, the, um, with the device that we use for doing the, uh, the hole into the, um, uh, the graft, we have the parallel um, the, the equidistance uh, hole for the uh, for the graft for the screw insertion and we drill and we have to uh, be um, careful where for the second cortex because uh, we may have uh, the nerve just behind us so the position is uh, uh, the critical point of the latergé uh, because uh, many of the problem of the Latergé came from uh, the protrusion of the graft, that means that is too lateral and can cause, uh, um, can abrade against the humeral head. So we should not, not be to be lateral, but not to medial, otherwise we lose some of the bony effect, not to proximal, but not to distal. Because if you go to distal, your graft will be lower, like in this case, and your inferior uh, screw will keep uh, a small amount of bone. So it's not useful for stabilizing the, uh, the graft. So the ideal position is between three and five o'clock. Uh, I use uh, this device because as you see, give me the, this offset, give me the distance between the margin of the glenoid and the margin of my bone graft. This is important to avoid uh, the uh, position too much lateral of the, um, uh, of the graft. Once we, we have uh, uh, decided about the position, the problem of the Latergé is the integration. Uh, we know that if we put uh, nine, uh, perpendicular the, uh, the screw on the bone, we have good contact with good stability. But the problem in, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in the shoulder is that if we go parallel, uh, 90 degrees, sorry, pa um, perpendicular, we may have uh, the protrusion of the screw inside the joint. So this is a big uh, issue for this kind of surgery. So we need, obviously, these things are easy when we have bony defect, big bony defect. But when we have small bony defect, oh, we do, uh, we do Latergé procedure uh, because we, the incompetence of, uh, uh, of the um, uh, soft tissue ligaments. So we, we may encounter this problem. Like in this case, this is a big problem. We need to, rev to revise this, this surgery and maybe uh, we have done more uh, problem to the uh, humeral head. So we have to uh, careful uh, follow the curvature of the glenoid and, and the depth of the, of the glenoid, not to be uh, down, so protrusion, but never overhang the, uh, the humeral head. And uh, for this reason, we start to use, uh, for several reasons, but this is one of the start we use the plate, because as you see, uh, we can have the inclination of the graft uh, uh, according to the, um, to the glenoid neck uh, when we use uh, 
the uh, the wedge. So we screw in, and the wedge allows us to rotate just a small just a small amount, uh, ten degrees. But it's enough to have more uh, surface of sta of stability or contact of the graft over over the neck. And also, uh, we have another reason because not only for compression, but also for the stress shielding, we use the plate. Uh, without a plate, we may encounter one of the terrible uh, complica intraoperatory uh, complicants of the, um, of the screws, that is breakage of, of, the, um, of the graft. And uh, you see, if we put an anchor, if we put a, um, a screws, we may do too much force on the, on the head of the um, of the screws. Instead, if we dissipated the screws over uh, a big uh, a bigger surface, we may have more surface of contact and more spread of the force along the graft. But obviously, you can do uh, latérage. Uh, as the way you like it, there's no, no problem. This is just one Howard thought. Uh, we use uh, this device that you see down, down here, and we call it uh, uh, joystick. Uh, he has, uh, the, this device has two functions. was in keep uh, uh, the glenoid, the, the graft and the, um, and the plate, we have the, the, the second, uh, um, uh, this, this second device that can push against the graft, the, um, uh, the plate. And then we, we use introducing uh, a, K, a K wire. You see, we have the K wire, and then we check with the K wire the hole that we have done before the long KY and the short KY. And with the joystick, we push the graft to the neck. You see, you, we go down there to, uh, without putting any fingers. And we have uh, this device can, that can help us in uh, um, uh, pushing the, the graft down. Obviously, we have to remember to remove um, the, uh, the key wire because it can bend and it can be difficult to, to remove. And then we, um, we have all the, the system inside and we go with the second, uh, uh, with the second screw and uh, uh, the surgery, the great part of the surgery uh, is done. Now I will see you. Uh, I will check. I will show you uh, what's happened if you if your graft is too proud uh, against the uh, is not in line with the surface. So it's no flush. You can revise and you can uh, uh, use this this little bore to uh, make uh, uh, the surface as smoother as uh, an in flush and in line as you want. I told you before that. There is one another problem if we uh, go too much uh, uh, posterior, especially if we if we don't measure the uh, the depth of the glenoid, because uh, we have to remember that we have the nerve, the suprascapular nerve behind our screws, and the nerve is more uh, close to the um, uh, to the screws uh, when we don't have. Uh, uh, bony defect. So uh, remember, this is one of the reasons because we want to stay uh, parallel to the glenoid surface. So remember to, to be in line with the cortex when we do uh, this kind of lateral shape, so measure the, the distance, the depth of the, of the uh, glenoid. The other problem of, of this kind of surgery, so the lateral shape, is the integration. We have done a paper uh, some years ago uh, that want to study the integration of this part because 
uh, as I told you, we have a good integration in the, in, the, uh, in the lateral part and not so good integration in the lateral part. So we divided the, the, um, uh, the graft into uh, uh, four parts superior, four parts inferior, uh, four part medial, four part lateral, uh, just to understand which is the difference of the uh, integration of, of this. And what we found is that the super or medial superficial and the super or medial depth are the, the place of the, of the graft in which we may encounter less integration. And this piece of, uh, uh, of graft is uh, uh, the piece that goes uh, um, to uh, re reassorption. So uh, it's important to understand this, but it's also important to understand that resorption doesn't affect the result of the lateral So it's important that we, we have uh, uh, the depth, the, the depth uh, layer that is important for the uh, um, uh, bone, the, for the blood that came from the bone and the superficial factor as the bone, the, the blood that, that came from, uh, uh, from the uh, conjoint tendon. <clears throat> Another important thing is uh, the uh, where is the graft because according to the um, wolf law we know that uh, if we have a stimuli on the bone so the bone is still, uh, still going there is not going to uh, reassociate and uh, uh, we have done also this paper and uh, we, we are see that uh, uh, where we have less stimuli, biomechanical, less stimuli, there is much reassorption of the, of the bone. See, so the resorption is higher in the part that is not under, um, under forces. Obviously, the best things is when we have a bony defect and this is clear, put the graft where the bony defect is to have best biology and best biomechanics. But uh, uh, when we have, when we do procedure only, almost only for a soft tissue problem, we can expect osteolysis. And uh, um, if we have good uh, bone loss, generally what we have seen that there is no uh, bone loss uh, uh, of the of the graft. Uh, this is just to the end uh, to to understand uh, to come back to the capsula before closing the graft. We can put a small anchor and reattach the capsula. Uh, this is important, especially in uh, uh, in the case in which we don't have we have la much laxity or um, very distract of the soft uh, tissue or when there is no much bony defect, because in this case, we put too much stress on the anterior capsula because we medialize too much. And this is uh, the aspect uh, after, after surgery. Uh, we can uh, obviously close the capsula. We give two points to the capsula and uh, subscapularis together and we close and we don't see uh, any difference in uh, um, uh, retaining in abduction external, any problem with the ROM. And we see well, that we close easily. And this is the effect of the uh, abduction and external rattache. You see how the, the graft is, is put in tension is put in tension during abduction and external rotation. So the, the conjoint tendon, the inferior part of the, um, of the subscapularis is put in tension and to avoid, uh, to, to stop the translation of the humerus to, to avoid any dislocation. Thanks for your attention. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Yeah. Thank you.
so karthik if we can start some uh, uh, questions yes sir yes. Uh, thank you dr alberto for the excellent session uh, going on with the questions uh, uh, one question from my side we are aware of the hillsax lesion and it's the reason times we are taking the bipolar lesion into account now we know the work of uh, dr emamoto who has split the hillsax into peripherally tracking lesions and centrally tracking lesions in hillsax and uh, seeing in regard to the outcome centrally tracking is doing better and peripherally tracking this is again based on the location of the hill sacs so do you consider the uh, fact of peripheral and centrally tracking lesions in your practice yeah we we check that the um, first we check the uh, the hill sacs uh, according uh, as i told you as a bipolar uh, concept that means that uh, hill sacs is important according to the glenoid defect uh, what we check uh, first in, uh, in the glenoid is how much the glenoid, uh, um, the hill sacs, uh, is, uh, um, uh, can give us the on track or off track uh, situation. So uh, if it is more medial or it maintains lateral. This is what we, we, we look uh, at the basis. Uh, even because uh, uh, we don't have big, big uh, um, uh, bony defect to, uh, to cover or to uh, apply this, uh, this concept. Uh, because generally uh, with our patient, um, uh, the glenoid track give us the, uh, the uh, information, the sufficient in, uh, information to understand if we are doing uh, the right choice. When we have uh, big, big hill sacs, uh, we do uh, two things. Um, or we do with remplissage, that is uh, one of the steps we can do, or we do with graft to, for, for the graft for the hill sacs. But this is very rare at the moment. I just remember uh, the... Um, uh, two cases of graph for for it sucks. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, okay, one more question to that: Have you, in your practice, encountered scenarios where you had to add on a remplissage along with a latage? We we know there are some people talking on to that. So have yeah. you in your practice? Yeah, um, uh, we start to do uh, as I told you. Uh, we start to uh, to as less invasive. Uh, so doing little less latergé than before, uh, because we apply um, uh, the, the principle of Giovanni of uh, uh, glenoid track. And uh, uh, so uh, we start now to do, to start now, we start from, uh, from, from uh, while, once a while uh, to do uh, soft tissue procedure, bankard procedure with uh, um, uh, remplissage and uh, we start with this but we start remplissage uh, in a revision case of latergé we have a different case of uh, uh, recurrence uh, of the instability after latergé procedure and uh, we treat the patient with uh, um, uh, like an arthroscopic banker we we are able to re-put in tension the anterior inferior glenoid uh, uh, humeral ligament and uh, doing uh, remplissage. We treat the patient, the, the, to, summary, to summarize, we uh, treat the patient that present with recurrence of latergé with uh, like pseudo bank at repair and, uh, um, uh, and remplissage. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, thank you. Hi, Roshan. Welcome. Hi, sir. Roshan, any questions to Alberto? Maybe say hello to him. You have to unmute yourself, Roshan, so we are not able yeah. to. Yeah, Alberto? Yeah. Uh, hey. Hi. And, uh, that is a wonderful talk, Alberto, as usual. Uh, I just have two questions for your uh, presentation. That is one on uh, the placement of coracoid uh, as far as the lethargy goes. Uh, what exactly is the best position? The inferior? the uh, um, centrally located or a little bit more medial and more lateral 
so is there any confusion on that because the healing pattern will change according to your position as uh, you you said in your paper one of the paper along with johnny jaycomo so i want to know your point on that and a second question i will ask you later okay uh, uh for me the if you have a, a little bony defect of the glenoid the best place is where is the the defect of the glenoid you can choose the defect choose for you where to put the graft you 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 understand what i mean yeah and the second when we do um, arthroscopic um, lateral shape procedure for recurrence uh, without bony defect uh, we put about 3 from about fifth, um, five o'clock. That means that uh, the inferior uh, screws is a five o'clock. And then we have our device that put the second uh, screws just above. But first anchor, first uh, screw is at a five o'clock. Uh, second question, this is related to your decision making and uh, bony surgeries in instability. So how do you choose? Because now uh, initially we had a 25% as a a landmark for the bone defect, then it narrowed down to 20%. Uh, that is a wonderful paper by Giovanni Giacomo. Then it came to 17.3% by uh, a Korean uh, study, and then now 13.7%. And eventually, I think last paper you showed that was a 10%. So what exactly is the percentage which, uh, which will suggest that this patient is going to require a latarge and he is not fit for bank card? Uh, we look uh, we look at several parameters when we decided to do lateral J. Uh, as I told you, the age of the patient is important. The bilateral uh, presence of instabilities is important. Uh, type of sport is important. Um, uh, time, this is called elapsed time. That means uh, time from dislocation to uh, reduction and time to dislocation to first uh, uh, surgery is very important. Um, recurrence of instability is important. People who are operated uh, from uh, in the other side and then decided to do the other, the other side for uh, any problem. These are all parameters that are important for us to decide what kind of surgery uh, we have done in, in, the, in the case. Uh, but as I, as I told that during the, the talk, what we are, we are just coming back a little on uh, the amount of latergy uh, that we do. Uh, not a lot, but uh, uh, we decided to do more um, soft tissue procedure and uh, um, uh, having uh, uh, reemplissage. And uh, at this moment, especially in young people, and also I have, uh, um, uh, I, I deal with uh, uh, young people uh, that do um, rugby, that are rugby players. Uh, this solution at the moment uh, give me very uh, beautiful results. And uh, uh, I leave, we leave uh, arthroscopic for uh, recurrence for uh, uh, people that are previously uh, operated um, uh, or is of uh, bony defect for um, uh, off track uh, all the off track lesion. Alberto, if you do have a contact athlete with a, a, a bony bank cart, which is a chronic bony bank cart, and you evaluate that there is a bone fragment still there. But the bone loss is around 15% or something like that. So if you plan to do a latarge, so would you remove that bone fragment and then put your uh, coracoid or you just add on a coracoid? How do you do it in such cases where there is already a bone fragment there? Yeah, this is a good question. Uh, I have done one last week uh, for, for this. Uh, I, remove, I remove the fragment okay. because I have two points of healing. Fragment with the, good, with the bone and uh, graft with, yeah. with the bone, too much, mm -hmm. too much. So I remove, refresh, and apply the, the graft of the, um, uh, okay. of the coracoid. 
and Alberto, there are these uh, 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 plates which are coming with the screws. So uh, these are like Arthrex has their uh, own small lethargy plate. So would you actually use it sometimes? Uh, are it dark, dark indicated? Would do they Sorry. have Sorry. the plates? The lethargy plates. These are small locking plates which are there for uh, coracoid uh, fixation. Not just screw, but with a small add-on a plate. No, I don't know. Mm -hmm. They didn't present it to us. Okay, okay. Roshan, have you used lethargy plate? I have, I have used one. Uh -huh. uh, because I was very influenced by Dr. Giovanni when he visited our center. Uh -huh. And uh, he told me to use it once. But, uh, you know, I, I am not a great fan of that. Now okay. I shifted to only two screws. So my preferential screw is to only two screws. Okay. So Bhupesh, Prem, uh, Tejas, any questions? Yeah. Uh, Can I say something? Doctor, yeah, please, please go ahead. Uh, uh, Dr. Albert. Yeah, you, th there's no problem of not using the plate. This is uh, one of our thinking to uh, outspread the forces. And uh, at the beginning, we thought that uh, uh, having a better contact, we can increase the percentage of uh, healing of the, of the graft. But I'm still concluding um, a, a paper on, uh, uh, with our friends on arthroscopic latergy and open latergy using or not using the plate. And there is no difference in terms of res or resorption of the bone. So the, bo the, the plate uh, is not important for the, uh, for the resorption because it's similar in both way, but is uh, for me, I go sleep well when I feel the sensation of the, of the graft with the, um, with the plate. But absolutely, there is no difference. And uh, I agree, everyone can use a, there is a suggestion, but it's no big advance uh, in terms of resorption. I, I will I'll tell you our reason why we stopped it. It was a very technical reason. The Indian coracoids are very, very small as compared to the European ones. The Indian coracoids, the average length is between 20, 20 millimeters. So sometimes yeah. it's very difficult to get two screws itself. And the, when you use plate, you are committed for those two, uh, you know, the length of the plate and the position of the screws. Sometimes it's very difficult to get that. And sometimes I may have to use one screw and one anchor so, okay. that, so as to get a maximum fixation because the coracoids are so small that it, it may not be possible to accommodate two screws for that position. And that is the reason why we shifted from out of the plate. Yes, Bukesh. Uh, this is an issue if you have a small coracoid, absolutely. Yeah. You, yeah. You, you can uh, uh, invent it, uh, a small plate for... Small plate, yeah. <laughs> but uh, Alberto, yeah. I have a technical uh, uh, query in the procedure. See, um, the screws that we place, so how do you measure? Because we are always worried about the suprascapular nerve in the back. Uh, so it's very difficult to put in your uh, measuring depth gauge and measure at this level uh, during the end of the surgery. So do you always go with the 35 and then check in C-arm and then reduce it? Or do you have a technique where you do a pre-operative measurement? Or what do you, what, what, how do you actually define your size? Yeah, the, the, when, you, when you make the hole into the glenoid, you have a good exposure. This is, you are in line if you use the measurement system, that, that's no problem, absolutely. And you can check it. Uh, I say measure because it's better to know not to go uh, much over the, uh, the second cortex. At the moment, we are, uh, we are using uh, um, 30, 32 in female, 32, 34 in male. This is the measure, the average measure that we have. Thank you. See, yeah, the, thank that you. is the thing I was asking. We all have an average measure. We all, we all, uh, you know, kind of have something in mind. And uh, yeah. measurement takes the secondary uh, step here. So Doctor Tejas has a question to ask. Uh, my question for Roshan, sir. Sir, when you yes. use uh, one screw and one anchor, so. Uh, are you past those, uh, those uh, anchor threads from the hole of uh, the hole through the graft, or how you uh, fix the uh, graft by anchor? Yeah, you can you can go all around anchors. We have done two three techniques. One is either you can go all around the uh, graft and fix it as a, a pull out, or else you can just pull out your threads through the hole. 
uh, which you have done for the screw and you tighten on the other screw you know either way you can do it just like that and yeah yeah prem you had a question yes sir uh, thank you dr albert of your fantastic talk i have a technique regarding your screw placement suppose in case if you develop a suprascapular nerve injury uh, how will you manage it post op what are your tips like uh, in case the dialus says patient develops paresis uh, uh, what is your management plan if the patient develops a suprascapular nerve injury remove the screws uh, yes and then uh, no that's in the not in the near it's in the late post op not maybe the patient develops are presenting with a a paresis uh, two weeks after the surgery so what do you do like some bit late presentation remove the screws and put uh, sh lower um, shorter screws if you look with uh, axilla uh, with um, with x rays if the screws are the real problem sometimes uh, you have the problem because you may have there some hematoma that can push against the the nerve so uh, uh, when, when we discard the patient after, sur after surgery, we have a native view and we have a Bernard, Bernard Joe view to, to check uh, the, the length of the screws. And that's it. If the screws are, are inside, that's no problem. Maybe the hematoma. Do you use a solid screw or a, a cannulated cancellous screw? What's your choice? Cannulated screw 4.0. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Alberto, I have I have a question on uh, uh, technique as well as the the evolution of the technique. So uh, when we started the uh, lethargy, maybe you 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 guys have started around 30, 40 years before uh, when we started. So you must be having more and more experience about this different way of doing lethargy, because everybody uh, as 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 you have shown in your presentation, the uh, congruent dark lethargy, which was popular by Jody Bear and by Steve Burkhart. And the uh, regular uh, arc lethargy, uh, which has been popularized by uh, Jill Walsh. So, how do you find these two different techniques behave differently? Is the glenohumeral arthritis rate in congruent arc is lesser because it doesn't take into the consideration of the articular cartilage of the glenoid side, and you can go a little down on medialization of the graph, or your uh, regular uh, Jill Walsh technique is better? So, as far as the glenohumeral arthritis is concerned. Yeah, no, I, I never done a congruent arc uh, with you, uh, mostly in face view. That means that we put the, the glenoid like uh, Jill Walsh. I never done. One my concern of the congruent arch is the, the stress uh, um, uh, of the screws because uh, it can be used uh, in a big, in a big uh, situation of uh, bone loss. That's important in that case. But the problem is the, uh, is the forces, is the bending forces uh, is very high because you can cover the anterior inferior quadrant and he has a lot of pressure there. So um, I never try, but it, this, is, this point is one of my concerns about this, uh, uh, this technique. So I, I just wanted to know which group, like your group is the one who use regular lethargy gets a higher number of glenohumeral arthritis or the people who do the glenohumeral, uh, the congruent arc get the more glenohumeral arthritis? I don't know. Uh, uh, what's your observation? No, my the observation that I can do is that uh, my group, Giovanni, me and the, and the other, uh, we don't have problem with, uh, uh, with arthrosis or something like that. This depends only on uh, where you put the graft, but I know I have experience with uh, with the other technique. Uh, uh, Albert, yeah, I yeah. uh, have a couple of questions. What is your ideal cutoff value, especially for the bone loss, where you would like to switch over from a classic latage to a bone block procedure? So that would be my first question. Question two, if opting for a bone block, what would be your bone block of preference? Be it uh, the J tech, I mean, what is your ideal uh, bone block preference? Um, for the first question, my idea is uh, to stay about 15%. This is the threshold that, um, that for me is important. And uh, also uh, you can push some indication in younger people 
uh, not to do lethargy uh, with this kind of uh, um, uh, of bony defect, but fifty percent is my threshold. And uh, for the second, the second question was uh, in the technique of, of your yeah, yeah technique for bone block. Uh, oh, if not lethargy. Yeah, the yeah iliac crest yeah. block like iliac crest. Iliac crest. Yeah. You take the iliac. One last question: What is your rehab protocol? Preferred rehab protocol? Yeah, we keep in sling the patient for three weeks, and then we start uh, a movement on a scapular plane um, and uh, exercise uh, against resistance after uh, small resistance after uh, two months and a half, and uh, three months. Uh, um, uh, uh, sports, sport related exercise for months uh, they can play because the uh, the healing here is like a fracture. There is no soft tissue to heal. The, if the bone doesn't heal in three months, doesn't heal anymore. Yeah, Roshan. One last question. Yeah, you had a question, Roshan. Yeah, I have a question for Alberto. Alberto, I, I know you guys are treating a lot of uh, tennis players. The ATP tennis players, the tennis players from Barcelona, Europe, you get a lot of them. So what is your choice of surgery in those patients? Because they are, these are the overhead athletes. They require a very good shoulder range of motion. Secondly, the end range, end range motion and stability is very important when they have a delayed cocking and the especially the uh, when they're serving the first shot. So do you have a difference of opinion on uh, performing lethargy in those patients or you still do a lethargy even if uh, it is a top class ATP player? Uh, I think that uh, we have to, to divide the, the people into professionalism and into uh, recreational athletes. If um, professionalism has uh, needs uh, lethargy, Maybe he don't can play anymore, but not for the lethargy, but for the general instability that these people has. Uh, for recreational instability, uh, recreational people, uh, the problem is not uh, uh, for the uh, lethargy because they can play with lethargy uh, with no problem, and uh, there is no. Uh, loss of restriction of movement. Uh, this is due to the um, uh, because we don't re, re, uh, re put in tension the, the, the capsula, the anterior inferior capsula, and so we don't give much stress when the people has an anterior, anterior um, abduction, external rotation for, for serving. Uh, so for me, the lethargy is, uh, is not a big issue for standard people to play. Uh, we have uh, many of them and there is no problem. For high level people, uh, for ATP players, uh, just thinking lethargy in their shoulder is a, is a nightmare because the, there is no the same level of activity like uh, they, they, they wanted for, for to stay at that level. Absolutely. Can I ask one last question? Same. Same, yeah. Can I ask one last question? Yeah, please, please, please. Dr. Albert, do you have any tips in the position of the arm during the surgery, particularly during the critical steps, like when you do a crooked osteotomy and when you do the capsula closure, like when you, how will you keep the arm in abduction, adduction? What is any tips on it? Yeah, uh, for, um, for the osteotomy, uh, we have a small... Uh, um, server just side of us is a, is a small place where we have where we put the um, the arm or we use a mechanical system to hold the arm mm -hmm. uh, in uh, for the coracoid there's no problem um, instead when we start to do uh, capsular shift we are in external rotation and then we split the uh, the muscle we, and we go to the uh, to the capsula. When we do capsulotomy, we make an internal rotation. We release the capsula. We cut the capsula, and then with the uh, with the blade, 
we, we keep fix the blade and we make an external rotation. So the capsula comes to the blade and we cap till, uh, till, the, um, till the labrum, till the neck. Uh, this is that the, the two point. And the other point is that when we uh, close the capsula, we have in a, a slight abduction and 30 degrees of external rotation, and then we close the capsule. Thank you, Dr. Albert. I think Tejas has put a question on the chat box here. Uh, uh, Alberto, maybe you can answer. His question is, when you do a capsule plot meme uh, while doing your lethargy, so is it a vertical capsule strip split or a horizontal uh, split? Uh, or we do horizontal split. Horizontal split. We do horizontal split, and then we elevated uh the medial part uh, up above and we um uh, we remove with the with the also with the scalpel with the, uh, the inferior part so we okay. have like uh, like in, like in this case in yeah. Yeah. Uh, he also puts, puts another question anybody of the faculty on the panel having used adjustable loop to fix the graph instead of screws so maybe alberto roshan uh, karthik anybody of you guys no, nobody. Uh, Alberto, no adjustable, uh, always screws. Only screws. Only screws. So I think that answers your question, Tejas. Uh, thank you, Alberto, for a wonderful uh, uh, presentation and a good, he healthy discussions. Thank you, Roshan, for joining in um, uh, to help us in discussions. Bupesh, thank you very much. Tejas, Prem, all, thank you very much. It was indeed a wonderful presentation today. And I think uh, all of our members of Indian Arthroscopy would have learned quite a lot uh, after hearing this webinar and uh, these discussions. Uh, friends, uh, just a simple announcement. We do have a next webinar coming on uh, on the, the 27th of November. That's Friday at 6 p.m. Uh, Dr. Amendelo, he is a very, very uh, famous uh, professor, uh, director of the sports medicine uh, and uh, from U.S. And he's going to, uh, from North Carolina, U.S. And he's going to do uh, a symposium on... Uh, uh, posterior uh, arthroscopy for ankle and hind foot pathologies. Where are we today? And uh, this would be something which we have not discussed in any of these previous symposiums. And so do tune in to Indian Arthroscopy Society YouTube channel on uh, 27th November at 6 p.m. for this wonderful webinar. Uh, 